I'm so glad to be here with you today to share some of the work I've been doing and uh, what we've been doing at Carnegie Mellon. Those coming in, there are a few seats up in front and I don't bite, so <laughs> feel free to come on up. So um, as uh, advertised, I'll be talking about applying principles of learning to teaching. Um, those of you who have already um, become early adopters of technology, there will be something here for you. Those of you who may be thinking about it, it's um, sort of with or without technology, I think a lot of these ideas apply. What I want to start with is um, actually one of the results of a study that maybe uh, was uh, part of what um, you read about. Um, and, and use that as a starting point for the conversation. It's actually a pretty interesting result, striking result, um, that even surprised us at Carnegie Mellon when we, um, when we got it. So what we did is we uh, were studying an introductory college course, um, and we gave students a pre-post test from the beginning of the semester to the end of the semester. It happened to be a statistics course. Is there statistics in your curricula, maybe? Um, it's very common, right, across undergrad and grad curricula. Students at Carnegie Mellon spend more than 100 hours, but sadly, there was only a 3% learning gain from pretest to post test, which is not actually significantly different from zero. So, really <laughs> sad result, right? And you might be saying, oh, well, maybe it was just a boring lecture or, or a you know, poor professor. It was actually an award winning faculty member in the statistics department and not. Um, and, and not a, um, a quite up to date. It had been updated with the computer lab sessions for students to actually do statistics. So we thought, this is something to work on. It's not actually surprising that this result would be so low because a lot of these large lecture classes across the country, especially in science, technology, and engineering fields, are finding the same kind of result. So it's disheartening, what can we do? What we did is we had um, been developing an online course for statistics, and we thought this would be a really great opportunity to use the materials and activities that were built into that course in a blended mode, so that students would have some face-to-face -face time with the instructor, but a bunch of their time would be spent working with the online course materials. And we really put ourselves to the test by running the same material in this course in a mini semester. So students were spending less than half the time in the pre-test post -test measures. We saw an 18% <coughs> learning gain, which is significantly different from zero and way more than what students had been doing in the traditional case. So what I'm going to talk about today really is what, is, what are some of the differences and how can we think about moving all of our courses to be more um, supportive and enhancing of student learning outcomes? That's, like you said, it's not necessarily about the teaching, it's about the learning. Um, to give you a little more detail on this study, just so you um, have a feel for it, um, the traditional uh, section, students would go to four class meetings per week. Um, three of those were lectures and one was a computer lab, 15 weeks of instruction, and their homework then was to read the standard textbook and submit problem sets. Um, they had tests in class and a final exam. Those tests were fairly well matched between the two, in particular this one, the Comprehensive Assessment of Statistics. Um, is a test that we took off the shelf. It's a very conceptual, uh, reasoning-oriented test, and it really is the basics you would hope in any introductory statistics course that students would learn. What differed between the two were that in the blended course, um, the students only met with the instructor two times per week for eight weeks. In, uh, at Carnegie Mellon, that's a mini semester. So when these guys were taking their midterms, these guys were taking their final exam. Um, in the big difference was in the homework sessions, the students in this course worked on uh, the materials from the online statistics course built on the Open Learning Initiative platform, and they did that according to a fairly fast-paced schedule. Um, and then the neat thing about it was the instructor could see what they were doing, where they were having problems, and so forth. So actually, those two 50-minute classes were spent rather differently in this blended course. They were more tailored to what the students needed, um, as opposed to in the traditional class, they were sort of week three, Monday, same lecture as last year, as the year before, and so forth. So we had, in this case, um, uh, the same content 
but different kind of instruction. And just in case you're wondering, those we know are uh, different in time. These were designed to be the same. We did actually do a little bit of a, uh, a log study to make sure that students in the blended course weren't spending hours and hours more outside of class, and they weren't. <laughs> Big surprise. Um, what they were doing is they were spreading their homework time a little more evenly through the week, which we think also might be a good thing for learning reasons rather than cramming it all. Um, like these students spent most of their time the day before a problem set was due doing their statistics homework. So just to show you that 3% uh, and 18% um, result pre-post um, in a nice table format, this is what um, that blended Con, uh, condition we're calling also the adaptive accelerated because we accelerated the timeline and the teaching was more adapted to students learning needs as compared to the traditional control so you can see we really had a nice effect this was actually so striking that we wanted to make sure it was a real result so we replicated it in two additional studies one with a larger group of students in the two groups and yet again with a different instructor um, just to make sure, and in every case we found this kind of difference. Also, I don't have the graph here because I wanted to get right to this learning science, but um, in one of the studies we actually brought students from both groups back the beginning of the next semester into the lab to do a few follow-up test questions to see not only did they, you know, how much did they learn and could show at the end of their course, but how much had they retained and could transfer, and we saw that the benefit of the adaptive accelerated group was maintained, even at a retention interval, which in fact was a little bit longer for these students because they finished a few weeks earlier than these students. So we were pretty happy about that. Um, this study was um, based on really just trying to see if we could improve student learning outcomes, but what I want to do is dig down into what we did in basically what did we do to change the course that might be um, principles and strategies that would resonate and that might um, relate to some of the things you're already doing or that you might be able to incorporate in your own teaching for your own students' learning? So what I'm really going to do in the rest of this presentation is uh, talk about three um, categories of reasons why these uh, we think there was such a benefit of the adapted accelerated condition. So the three reasons why are one, we embedded the science of learning into this. Um, we used some best practices for teaching and we effectively applied technology. I should say, I do, I sort of have a love-hate relationship with technology. So far everything's good with this. But I don't want you to think that I am a person to advocate technology just for technology's sake. As I think you'll see throughout the rest of this presentation, the idea that I'm espousing is that there are places where you can use technology to leverage it where it's going to do the most benefit, and that's really where I think um, we should be spending our time. So let's start with the science of learning. So this is my field. I um, am trained as a cognitive, experimental cognitive psychologist and do a lot of work in the learning sciences where we have a whole body of theory and uh, empirical results around the mechanisms that underlie how people learn. And there are all these things that we've come up with. I feel kind of proud that like physics has the Newton's laws. In psychology, we even have something that's risen to the um, label of being called the power law of learning. Um, in that sense, th it is a uh, specification of phenomena of learning that you can actually quantitatively describe. And so that's really nice because um, at Carnegie Mellon, a lot of the things that we do are not just to um, talk about the theories and um, conduct experiments, but we actually build the theories into computational cognitive models. So you can sort of put, put the theory in a computer program, run it, and then generate the predictions of that theory to test them against the actual data. And this is one of the things that we do to really make sure our theories of how students learn are robust and accurate. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about the power law of learning because it is one of the most robust findings in my field and I think it's something that everyone would enjoy learning about. Um, so the power law of learning may actually be kind of familiar because it's one of those 
phenomena where as one thing increases, here practice, the thing you care about, say errors or accuracy, something measure of performance, improves. So errors go down but in such a way that there are marginally decreasing returns. So early on in practice, you can see there's a big drop in errors. As practice goes on, the improvement is um, more modest and sort of asymptotes, okay? That actually is a power law in, in mathematical terms and that's why this is called the power law of learning. This phenomenon is so robust that it actually makes it a powerful diagnostic, that you can actually tell how learning is work by looking at what we call these learning curves. Now, power laws of learning have been found in areas from uh, very physical things, um, physical learning, um, to higher order complex thinking processes um, with all different kinds of people in different task situations. So it's very, um, broad phenomenon as well. Now, this might look theoretically very nice and pretty, but any of you who have uh, been teaching students for a while, working with students, learning, might be a little bit skeptical of me right now because your data might not look exactly like that if you look at students' performance, say, across a semester. So maybe your data, naturally, I have this in my own classes too, look a little bit messier. And so, it begs the question, what's going on? How, if we have this robust power law of learning, how can we sometimes be seeing error rates or students learning that doesn't show that nice, smooth, um, asymptotically improving performance? Um, well, this is actually data from a statistics course. And these are the different practice problems. And these are the average student's error rates across those six practice problems. Does anyone have a guess as to why this is such a bumpy curve? The problems are different. The problems are different. Yes. Budding cognitive scientist in the front row. <laughs> So in so fact, frustrated yes, and, and this is exactly what happens, right? S students are getting problem after problem, but they're not actually practicing the same thing. And so when we analyzed the actual problems that went into this practice, we found this is statistics, right? So we found that the first three really loaded heavily and, and required students to interpret a histogram. These next two involved interpreting a table and the sixth one had a totally different skill involved, interpreting box plots. It was very new to students. So now what we can do is we can say, OK, actually, students weren't practicing the same thing across these six opportunities. They were actually practicing a lot of different skills. What if we reorganize those uh, error data and actually look at it according to the practice opportunity with a given skill. I just used a simple example to show you that now if you average those out, you get something that looks like the beginning of that learning curve. And I would argue this is the power law learning revealed in the data that you wouldn't necessarily see if you just looked at it across time. What does that say about the nature of learning? It says that as students practice a given skill, their performance improves on that skill and just that skill. Other skills are not affected. So when students are learning something um, and practicing it in one area, and then they move to practice something else, they actually are starting a fresh learning curve for that new set of skills. So um, the bottom line here is that as educators, we need to remember that learning is skill specific. And that's actually kind of hard because you all are experts in your field. So you probably don't think of all the different skills that are involved. You just know how to, you know, solve the problem, figure out the answer, you know, get the, uh, the research done, whatever the case may be. And so it's actually this um, idea that learning is skill specific that we take from the sciences, uh, the learning sciences, that I think can help us when we think about teaching practice. So now I'm going to move to the second part of uh, this, and that is to think about um, how that idea that skill learning, that learning is skill specific, can translate into best practices for teaching. It is worth noting that in the statistics class, we thought a lot about, in the design of that online course, 
what skills did students need to learn and could we give them enough practice at those individual skills? So that was sort of built in there. In terms of the practice of teaching, that power law of learning is just one of many different results um, in learning science, cognitive psychology, developmental psychology, organizational behavior. There are a lot of fields that actually do research that speak to how students are going to learn in a real live classroom. And um, so at the Everly Center where I work, um, we work with faculty helping to bring some of that research into their teaching practice. We've been doing it since 1982, not me personally. But um, this theme of translating research into practice is what we do. And so a couple of years ago, we decided to um, put all that into a book that is called How Learning Works. And so I'm going to tell you about a bit from this book, which is really um, seven principles of learning. Here's a sampling of some of them where we look at the research on how students learn and we give some description of the results from that research. But the real goal of the book then is to translate into that, translate that into strategies for teaching. And so what I'm going to focus on is uh, one of the principles in the book that relates to practice. Um, because this idea of power law of practice is really um, such a robust phenomenon. And um, in terms of the results related to practice and the principle around practice and feedback, you could summarize it in terms of there are three key things to keep in mind when you're thinking about giving your students practice. Um, one is you want that practice to align with the skills they need to learn. So that's going back to that power law of practice. It's skill specific. If students practice something in this skill area, actually even though you may see it's you know all part of uh, such and such a, a topic or a concept, they actually need to practice the skill, um, the, the different skills in order to learn that full body of knowledge. So making sure that you're actually having students practice what you want them to know and be able to do is really key. And then the other two are probably um, very familiar to you. Um, they need repeated practice and with that practice they're going to really get a power boost when they also are getting targeted and timely feedback. So let me just go through each of these um, quickly and then um, see about how that might relate to um, instruction in your cases and also in this introductory statistics course I've been talking about. So in terms of aligning um, with the skills, just to give you a feel for this, what I did is I came up with a, a sample. Let's say one of the skills you want to teach students is you want to make sure that they learn how to select and apply appropriate statistical tests. Okay? That's the goal. That's what you want them to learn. And so when you as a teacher are designing the instructional situation, the learning experiences for them, you need to keep that skill in mind because what is possible to happen is that there are two ways that you could think of giving students practice on that skill. And if you think about these two different ways, which one is going to actually help students really practice that skill of selecting and applying? What we found in our research is that if you have students, I'll put this is not as good a practice because here the students don't have to think about selecting. They just are applying whatever tests are from the back of that, uh, excuse me, they're just using what they learned in that chapter and they're not actually practicing that skill of selection of which is the appropriate thing to do here. And that's often the case. I'm guessing there might be situations in your own courses where you're teaching students multiple methods. Not only do they need to learn how to implement those methods, but they need to know when each of those methods should be used. And so thinking about different practice that's actually going to give them the opportunity to, to learn those conditions of applicability is important. So it would probably, in this case, be more targeted or aligned practice if students actually are given a problem and can't just guess which one based on the chapter that they got the problem in, but rather have to really think about and practice the skill of selection. Point here though, this is tricky. This idea of thinking about what are the component skills that students need to learn is tricky for you all because you're experts. 
And what happens as learning progresses is all those skills get combined together. And so when you're doing the uh, subject matter of your courses, you're probably not doing it in a step-by-step -step fashion as your students would need to learn. So it actually makes it hard for you to uh, all of us as experts in our own field to think about what are those skills and what would be the best practice opportunities for students. So this is just one of the interesting things and in why um, at the teaching center where I work, it's really nice for us to be a sounding board for faculty and to sort of help them reveal in some sense um, or uncover what are the component skills. And I like to analogize to tying your shoe, right? Or driving a car, driving a stick shift car. It's something that you do so many times in so many contexts that you don't even think about all the little steps. And if you think about it, it's pretty hard to teach someone to tie their shoes or to um, drive a stick because um, you don't have those individual skills in your mental representation anymore. But one of the tricky things, but that's one of the things about um, designing practice experiences for students is that it really helps to try to push yourself back to um, a, a place where you can think about those components. The other thing that um, is really important for practice is that it's repeated. And here's an example um, from the book, actually. And it's taken from a public policy course. It's a sort of realistic, not exactly real, but a realistic situation where a faculty member came to the Eberly Center um, in a similar situation where um, they had been <coughs> really trying to focus their students' practice on writing and really wanted their students to get better at writing. And so gave them three assignments thinking this will really improve their writing skills. What ended up happening is the students got that first writing assignment that was a policy briefing. They did it, they got some feedback, and then they were asked to write their second writing assignment, which was a persuasive memo, and they performed rather poorly. So the instructor spent lots of time giving feedback on that, and then the third writing assignment was an editorial, and the instructor said, why are my students not getting any better? Well, what was happening in this case I had to, we had to ask the question, are they really getting repeated practice? Well, on some skills they are, but what was tripping them up was the fact that each of these assignments they had to learn to write in a new genre. And so they weren't actually getting more practice in a given, they were having to switch and learn anew again and again. And so in this um, particular situation, it then became an issue, a question for the instructor. Okay. If I want to give them sufficient practice in any one of these genres, then I'm going to have attention. I'm going to have to decide, do I give them repeated practice at writing policy briefings so they can get better at that genre, but then how much do I um, want to think about maybe de-emphasizing one of the other genres? So in some cases, it's hard for us as instructors to give sufficient practice because there are so many different skills our students need to learn. It's even harder for instructors to recognize what's sufficient for students because a lot of times this is another aspect of the expert's blind spot. As an expert, it's easy for you to do uh, a task that you might ask your students to do and so it's hard to recognize how much time it's going to take them or that they um, may need more background information than you do and so forth. So this is why um, some of the best practices for teaching are actually a little bit hard on us as instructors, but also on students. And then the third piece of feedback is related to, uh, practice is related to feedback. And the idea is here that practice is great, but what really powers up practice is when there's a feedback loop so students can learn from what they've done. Um, the current situation a lot of times is that students do their homework, do their work, turn it in, and days or maybe even weeks later, they get back their graded papers. Well, I think that's not ideal, and I don't know if you feel the same, because what ends up happening a lot of times is then the students get the work back and they focus on the grade, not on what they did or didn't do right to help them in the future. Um, by the time they get the grade, maybe the class has already moved on to the next topic, and so they don't really feel like um, there's enough incentive for them to stay. They want to move on to the next topic and there's no incentive for them to remediate. What we really want is a situation where when students are practicing and getting feedback, 
we want them to focus on the feedback so that they can get a sense of their strengths and weaknesses and actually have see a path to remediate, see a path to personalize their learning. Maybe they did really well and can actually skip ahead. They don't need all that practice because they did so well on a practice opportunity. And so all of these ideas around practice and feedback I think are um, captured in this diagram that we have as the sort of um, model for thinking about practice and feedback. And uh, the principle as we stated is that goal-directed practice coupled with targeted feedback is really what enhances the quality of students learning. And so here the, the theme is that it's a cycle. So students practice which leads to some performance that then um, we can give feedback on and this is the thing that students often don't want to do. That they don't want to think about how can that feedback guide their further practice. Now remember the other thing I said is that sometimes it's hard for us to give students enough practice or if any of you have graded papers it takes a lot of time to give them rich feedback. So there's an issue of doing it effectively and yet being efficient enough that we're not all bogged down with the time it takes for practice and feedback. <coughs> and that's why I think it's important that goals are at the center of this wheel. And the idea that I think that can um, give us for helping with the efficiency issue is that when you give students practice and you give them feedback, you don't have to give them practice on everything or feedback on everything, but you can really target both the kind of practice they get and the feedback you give to the goal that you're really aiming for them to achieve. Um, <clears throat> my best example of this is a problem I have. Whenever students turn in writing to me, I really have a problem stopping myself from marking red everything that I could give them feedback on. But then I remember this and say, well, first of all, if I mark up everything, they may be overwhelmed and do nothing. Or, possibly worse, if I mark up the little grammatical things and then the big conceptual things and they actually do take the time to respond to my feedback, what are they likely to respond to? The easy fixes. But my real goal was to give them the help on the conceptual things like organization or conceptual structure of their argument and stuff like that. So this is where I really think about this practice and feedback principle and try to help myself focus my feedback. In some cases I'll even say to students for this assignment we're just I'm just going to give you feedback on this issue. So that doesn't mean that everything else in your paper is perfect but this is where I really want you to focus your efforts. That can be helpful for the student too because think about it the students a novice if they get feedback on 17 different things it may be hard for them to um, process all that and actually do the step of um, learning from what they did and your feedback and making it better next time. So those are some of the um, ways that I think practice and feedback can play out. Um, without technology, another thing that I often think of in terms of this wheel being more efficient is that sometimes it's just fine and actually plenty effective to give group-based feedback. So if you have students working on an assignment and giving individual feedback is really time consuming, but there are some really salient patterns that a lot of students had trouble with X, or a lot of students could use um, some more uh, focus on Y, that you can actually tell the class as a whole and share some examples related to that particular area rather than having to write um, the same comment on you know 25 out of 30 papers. So there are some other strategies for that I'd be happy to talk about with folks too. Um, <clears throat> so now we've talked about signs of learning and this one phenomenon the power law of learning. We've talked about how that practice can play out with feedback as a teaching um, instructional strategy. And now I want to talk about, with those two things in mind, how can technology be applied effectively? So, as I said at the beginning, I am uh, definitely someone who likes to incorporate educational technologies to improve teaching and learning, but to do that judiciously and deliberately where it's really going to make a difference. So, 
What I like to think about is that technology promotes learning when it's built into or on top of a solid course design. Because then, when you're using the technology, what does technology do? It helps us do things better and faster. So I like to start with a situation where we know this is a good course. Now, let's look at it and find ways that we can use technology to strengthen the advantages that are already in that course design. So making things more efficient and more effective. Now, what I've been talking about a lot is this idea of practice and feedback. So that's an area where technology can really help. Um, as I said, sometimes it's hard to give students enough practice. Um, feedback can be time consuming for the instructor or the graders. So if technology can automate some of that practice, give students um, repeated opportunities for practice, maybe even if it's a sophisticated enough tool, give students immediate feedback, that will be more efficient. And I would argue it also could be more effective because what that means is the students are getting practice and feedback tailored to their own response immediately. Remember in a typical case, um, the feedback comes at a delay. Here with technology, we can actually create a situation where the feedback's gonna help students understand their mistake right after they made it, when you really want them to be able to know what's right and what's wrong and why. And there are a lot of studies showing the benefits of uh, tailored feedback and immediate feedback for making learning more efficient and effective. So this is one way we can use technology, is to look at the courses we're teaching now, the methods we're using now, and to see what are some ways we can make those interactions more effective or more efficient for either us or our students. The other thing that technology enables is um, to open new opportunities. And the one that we've heard about a lot in the media lately, about technology's benefits, on education is that, um, well, with mobile devices and internet becoming so much more widespread, students have greater access to instruction than they ever did before. And with that access, they have greater flexibility. So students could get online and um, access some instructional resource 24 seven, whereas formerly they had to wait until it was time for class. Um, or when they were lucky enough to get into your school and participate in a course and buy the textbook and so forth. So online and asynchronous modes really increase these opportunities. But I actually think that's not the full potential of new opportunities that educational technology can offer. And I'm gonna tell you about the way that I think technology really opens a new and powerful um, <coughs> potential that has largely been untapped. So it's where we really need to be focusing our attention. And that is that when students are working with online instruction, we have the opportunity to watch, to capture the data from their learning interactions and analyze that learning data. Again, if we have a sophisticated enough technology, we can do that analysis on the fly to identify things like where students are having trouble. What are students' strengths? Um, are students doing the assignments that they're supposed to on time, or are they leaving it until the end and not spending enough time and spreading out their studies? These results that can be generated automatically or semi-automatically with educational technologies can be really informative to students. Um, students can get some advice or recommendation on what they're doing with their learning behaviors that could be more efficient. And we as faculty can get information about sort of what's a snapshot of our students right now. What would be the most beneficial thing we could do next class to help them meet them where they are. And the other way that the data can help is they can help us improve our courses because they can identify the real tricky spots in a course or the activities that were just tripping students up, um, confusing students or whatnot, so that when we go back to um, refine one of our course materials, we don't have to waste our time on an area that already was pretty good, but we can target. So one thing that I always think about as an example of this is 
You know how hard it is to make a good test, how time consuming it is. If someone could tell you, next time you make a test for that topic, this is really where you should focus your effort. All those other questions that you've used in the past, they're really good assessments, uh, challenging enough to students, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I think that would be really beneficial because then you can go in and surgically know where you should be creating, where you should be spending your effort. Or if you have some practice opportunities for students, a bunch of activities, you think they're all pretty good, but you want to make them better. If you don't have this kind of data, you're just, in some sense, um, you may be shooting in the dark to just spend your effort increasing the effectiveness of one particular activity. But with these kind of results, you could target those efforts and spend your time where you get the biggest bang for the buck. And so this is the visual that I like to capture, this idea that educational technology really provides us something useful by producing student learning data. So one is when students are interacting with the system, when they're not just passively watching a video or reading an online text, that's when this power is coming out. When students are solving little problems and getting feedback, or um, they're getting a quick comprehension check question, then we have some interaction between students in the system. Or you may have a situation where the technology allows students to interact with each other, and so those also, those interactions can become student learning data that can be used to um, give students feedback on their performance and on their learning strategies. Those data can also be analyzed to give us as instructors uh, more information about where our students' our strengths are, where they could use help. And then I think these are sort of slower loops where we can uh, improve the design of the course. Maybe that's once a semester. This might be more quick loops of feedback. And then also those student learning data can um, really serve to improve the science of learning. So when I was a graduate student, how did we conduct our experiments? Well, we brought in college sophomores into the lab and had them participate in sort of an arbitrary learning task. Okay, we'd get really clean data, but how realistic or authentic was it? Not so much. But when we have taken uh, instrumented, if you will, real learning tools in real classes, and we as learning scientists have those data, we can get not only really rich data sets, but data sets about how real students are learning in real classes, and that's super valuable. Three key results put into practice. Now you remember the um, study I talked about at the beginning and how I said that I would unpack what I thought made that new version of the course so effective. Well, we started with the power law of learning that emphasizes practice is really important and really identified the three ways that that practice should unfold to be most effective. That it's aligned with the skills students need to learn, it's repeated, and it comes with targeted and timely feedback. So I want to just go back into telling you more about that online course, how we developed it, and how it actually implements these practices. First, it was the case that the course design led the technology development, not vice versa. So in this case, um, I was working with a uh, statistics faculty member, um, in fact the professor who taught the traditional course, um, to identify what are the key skills students need to learn, generating multiple practice opportunities, and figuring out ways to um, what feedback would be best. So this was actually based on his analysis of the content, his expertise as an instructor, knowing what um, feedback students would likely need, and that's what went into the design. We then took these ideas and built lots of little tools like this. This is a picture of a question where students have a little setup. There's text that comes before this on the web page, and then they're going to fill out this chart based on what they just read about earlier on the web page. When they click on an option, an answer, they get feedback right here with some uh, suggestions and maybe a further prompt question. Also right here, they can request hints that show up so that all of that practice and feedback is immediate and it's right when students are doing the learning. 
So as you can see, this is a case where we had the skills with multiple opportunities for practice and feedback, and the technology really made it more efficient and effective. These practice opportunities were right there with the um, homework assignment. The feedback was immediate. And then, in addition to the question giving the feedback to the student, um, one of the projects that I worked on was to develop something we call the learning dashboard. And this is an instructor view of the learning dashboard where then more than just that one student doing that one question, but a whole class of students working on a whole bunch of activities. Well, that's great data, right? I was talking about the student learning data being so rich and valuable. But what instructor is going to have time to look through all those data sets and so forth? What we did is we built a system to analyze those data based on the power law of learning, what we know learning, how learning should work, and how the skills uh, map to those different practice opportunities. And then we give instructors a snapshot for this is one of the modules that has about seven different learning goals. And for each of those goals, this bar represents the class. Where is the class? in terms of their performance and learning so far with respect to um, that particular learning objective. So you can see in some cases the students um, as a whole, a lot of the bar is green, which is a, a quick way of signaling that the students have uh, learned that set of um, skills and that learning objective fairly well. Some have more yellow and red, which signals the students have been working in those areas, but based on the uh, interactions and the system's analysis of their uh, learning and performance, it looks like they have some difficulties of, in their learning. Um, and then these two gray bars, that just means that, yeah, there are a lot of opportunities for practice in this module for those two areas, but students haven't touched it yet. So if you're the instructor and you know they should have done this whole module, you actually have a lot of information in this one glance. You know that you don't need to spend too much time on these two areas. Maybe you want to think about what you might do in class to help students hone in on the difficulties here. And then the way I like to think of it is you might want to urge them to go back and do the exercises on these topic areas so that they don't miss out on the practice they need. And so this learning dashboard that I'm talking about here, I think it's another key piece of what made that um, first study I showed you lead to those good results because it gave the instructor a window onto what students were learning. And so one of the key ingredients is that it was informed by cognitive theory. So we were able to not just say students got this question right and this question wrong and give percent accuracy, but really use this data to make inferences about what students were learning. It was built on a solid course design, so we knew that there were practice opportunities with feedback, and we could map all those practice opportunities to make inferences about students' learning of the skills. And we also knew that we had to think about designing it in a way that it would meet students' and teachers' needs, so that it would be quick and easy to use, but that you could also drill down and get more detail. So here's another screenshot of that from a different module. And then if you click on one of those bars to see, OK, why has that one got some green, one, some, gr some red, and some yellow? Well, then you can see there would be um, more detail on individual students and where they are. And so you could you know, click on all the students in yellow and maybe email them or see what their performance was. You could also see for this learning objective, there are five different skills. And in some cases, um, one of those skills might be really uh, showing students struggles, whereas the others aren't. So then you know a bit better diagnosis of um, how to help support students' learning. Um, so I just wanted to end by saying that this uh, use of the blended course was um, something that the faculty and students um, were able to use quite well. And these, I think, are all faculty quotes um, where they were um, both at Carnegie Mellon and other institutions who've used this um, OLI statistics course with the learning dashboard. And one of the things that they're noting here is that it was really great to see um, what students um, were learning and weren't learning and this idea of coming to class and being able to uh, personalize or tailor the experience to what students needed felt a lot more um, satisfying for the instructors in this uh, experiment and other places where they're using it. 
So in terms of uh, bringing this all together, I think my take home message would be um, about thinking about educational technology um, in terms of a few principles. One that I've really emphasized a lot is that thinking about building it on top of solid course design where that course design is based on principles of learning and uh, best practices of teaching and then using technology to leverage that design. So looking for opportunities to increase efficiency um, through automation, scalability and access and then looking for opportunities to really open new opportunities to transform the teaching and learning to um, innovate and give students new access to information um, about their learning. Also, these opportunities may be open because you're spending less time grading or, or, or designing practice opportunities that you can focus on the high level aspects of teaching. And I'll end with a quote from uh, one of my former mentors, a Carnegie Mellon professor who really focuses on the learner um, which is how we began with our, the introduction, that learning results from what the student does and thinks and only from what the student does and thinks. The teacher, and I would also argue the technology, can advance learning only by influencing what the student does to learn. And I'll end there. Thank you very much. You. And uh, yes, questions? Please. First of all, with the comparison at the beginning between the traditional and the blended, so with the traditional, did that mean the students failed the course? Or did you get a very high percentage of failed? Very interesting. So, um, they didn't. In fact, the grade distribution between the two uh, groups was not that different. Um, I showed you the chaos test results, um, but I mentioned also that there were in class exams. Uh, performance on the in-class exams was slightly better in the blended condition, but not significantly different. And I think one of the uh, things that we can attribute to that, uh, number one, um, students, no matter what the learning experience is, when it comes time for a test, they'll you know buckle down and study to do what they need to do. Um, and then secondly, um, on those tests and students' grades, um, <clears throat> it depended uh, on things like partial credit and submitting homework and coming to class. So their grade could still be decent, in fact high, even if the learning that they took away when they were um, took away from the experience was not as um, robust. So that standardized test, that chaos test, is really asking them to apply what they learned in, um, in situations that we would expect them to be able to do, but I think it's just another example that it's hard for students to apply what they've learned um, in somewhat novel contexts. So the other question I had was with all the uh, immediate feedback and everything you've got with all these practice questions, etc. what do you do about security? What do you do with, about cheating? There are a couple responses to that. This is one area where I think the technology can help us, um, and sometimes it depends a little bit on the discipline. So in one case, um, a lot of educational technologies these days can allow you to create a pool of questions. Maybe you even do this with or without technology, and then any one student gets a sampling from that pool. Um, in that sense, if the pool is large, and students are trying to, and, and there's some breach of integrity of that uh, information, then um, it's not as if they've got the test they're going to take. They only have a sampling of the test they're going to take. And in my view, if they take the time to study the answers to that very large pool, <laughs> then maybe they probably have learned something um, that uh, would be uh, consistent with having actually studied it on their own. If the pool is large, that's one way to help. The other way is um, some of these resources are designed so that the openly available version does not have all the questions, but then you have to log on to get, if you're in a, a specific course, um, to get the stakes assessment items, but it still is an issue. 
And in fact, one of the things that I think is becoming, um, on my mind, because it's almost comes into, into an issue of regulation, is um, if a student is doing a course mostly or wholly online, we need to keep in mind that the identity of the student on the other end of that computer is who we think they are. So I, I definitely think we need to bear those issues in mind. And sometimes technology can help. Um, that's another reason this blended course was nice because it was not just that the students were only doing work online. They still had the in-class tests. Um, for, so you could view the online homework as really, you know, <clears throat> if you cheat on it, it's at your own peril in some sense. And they were much older. They were doing this chaos. Yes, yes, yes. The, the discussion it seems to more frequently cluster around this idea of learning and grades. And um, the feedback is important, practice is important, but grades create lots of problems. If you give yes, somebody an A+, plus, they walk away with the idea that they have mastered it, and then maybe that shuts them down from continuing to learn. If they get an F, they're demoralized. Is there any value, at least in formative stages, when to give feedback without it attached to a grade? I actually think that's quite valuable. Um, there are a few things that the research points to with regard to this. One is, um, I was talking about practice and feedback, and it's sort of a very cognitive issue. But you're raising the idea that there are um, identity and motivational and maybe emotional issues. They certainly are part of that whole learning process. And one of the things that there's a lot of research on is that students um, perceive their self-efficacy, how much they feel they can do it. Like, I feel I can you know, do well in this class versus I'm no good at statistics. There's no way I'm going to be able to do it. Those perceptions, those beliefs, have a huge impact on students' ultimate learning and performance. Why? Because it changes their behavior. It changes their attitude, their perseverance, and so forth. So I think. One of the things, whether it's by not talking about a grade and just talking about the feedback, that could be one strategy to help address that challenge. But I think there are a lot of ways to do it. And, and, uh, and so there are a lot of strategies we can use. Um, one of the strategies that's very helpful in terms of promoting student self-efficacy is to have a supportive environment where students feel like if they're struggling, they know that um, the, the, uh, the, the class situate their class is fair, that they're going to be evaluated fairly, that there's support when they need it, things like that. Um, so there are a lot of different ways. But I think you're right that grades do cause some of the problems here. Um, and in fact, maybe it focuses students' attention in the wrong place. Thank you very much. Thank you.